He said to his partner, the humans are upset. And when I looked into his blue eyes, the same feeling, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going, who are these people? And they could walk right among us. See, well, my story is really not significant. There's no way I could prove these people were something extremely unusual. Other people have reported these type of encounters. Even Timothy Good has reported that type of encounter. Many UFOs. Many UFOs. And um, could you tell, tell us who you are? Well, my name is uh, Bill Hamilton. I've uh, been involved in UFO research probably most of my life. I got involved in actual investigation of cases starting in 1976 with the Brian Scott case, and uh, that's when I joined MUFON and became a field investigator. So how long were you a field, field investigator for MUFON? Uh, probably since uh, 19, well, let's see, 25 years or, or more. Yeah. So how did, did you interact with um It was aliens? 1957. And uh, what I knew about UFOs, I learned from what I call the California contactees back at that time. And uh, there wasn't a lot of controversy about the contactees, about UFOs or whatever. Uh, one, in fact, I had started to meet the contactees. And uh, I was only uh, 14 and uh, had a, a buddy in high school. We were freshmen in high school. And I said, I would like to try an experiment. I would like to try an experiment along the same lines that George Hunt Williamson did in attempting contact with these UFOs. I, you know, I believe they're there, but I want to see if I can contact them. We tried this experiment, and obviously we did not have uh, ham radio equipment. We didn't have anything that we could use except an attempt at psychic contact by using pencil and paper. And uh, when we initiated this little experiment, we started to hear a sound uh, that was re re reverberating throughout the room. And so uh, we got up, we looked all around the apartment. He and I were, he was a French Canadian named Ives. He and I were uh, together alone in uh, his parents' apartment. And uh, we couldn't locate the source of the sound. So we decided to go outdoors. When we went outdoors, it seemed like the sound was emanating from the sky above us. So we uh, discontinued our little experiment, went downstairs, and sat on the grass. And as soon as we did this, the first thing that we saw was a very, well, it looked to us like it was tiny. A tiny red glowing disc just glide right over our heads soundlessly, right? One came by, a second one came by. At that moment in time, unknown to me, Ives continued the experiment. He was sending out a mental request for the second object that passed over to turn around and come back. And what happened as soon as he did that, the object executed a turn, a very, very tight 180, and came right back over our heads. Wow. And so he told me what he was doing and he said, if we see more, let's do it together. And um, we saw two more appear. And uh, they were all traveling from north to south. And so uh, we sent out a request for them to turn around and, and follow each other, right? And they did. 
I mean, it was almost instantly. Well, all together that night we saw 14 objects. Uh, after that, um, Ives' father uh, had to move and took Ives out of school and I didn't see him again. In fact, I haven't seen him until about ooh, three years ago. He found me on the internet and I found out he was right over in Bakersfield and he drove over to see me. When we talked, I also found out that was the only UFO experience he ever had and he still remembered every detail. He was impressed by it. So that was unknown to me at, at the time and I, I continued the experiments for three years. Well, only from my house, right? Mm -hmm. Until I took my I was living with my aunt, my grandmother, and I took her outside and I said, I've got one up there now. And she said, I'm watching television. And I said, well, you told me to tell you when I saw one of these, you'd like to see it. So I took her out there and I said, there it is. And she says, that's it? And I said, yeah, right now it just looks like a light high in the sky. I said, but watch this. Turn left. Turn right. She turned as white as a sheet, and she said, oh my God, you're talking to it. And I said, yeah, that's what I've been telling you all along. And then it occurred to me that she was just humoring me until she saw it for herself. Wow. And these experiments continued so that, uh, well, I had a very large object in 1958, hover. It was coming in faster than a jet stopped on a dime. I had a friend from across the street over. I had my first telescope. This thing was as big as a 747 and it just hung in the air. That's what stimulated me to think, how does it do that? I, I am going to study the science of gravity. I'm going to find out how it defies gravity and inertia, right? Two basic uh, qualities of a physical object. It's in, motion, right? Because when this thing, it flipped end over end and it started up again, I mean it was just like uh, it had no mass, it just went and started to climb and at that moment, I mean, my, my friend was looking through the telescope, it took that long for him to respond, look up and see it rise into the clouds. And then I mean I, I used to, then I started calling them down like using them for a yes-no game, right? It didn't even occur to me that there were logistics to this or anything, right? Just, oh, I just met this new person, says they're a contactee. If this is true and you know about it, can you show me, right? And sometimes they'd come over, dashing right over my head about 100 yards up. I mean, now they got lower, right? Um, then there was another time when it seemed like I was bathed in some kind of electrical shower, right? And then I could, there was, I started getting telepathic answers, very short, right? But uh, one of them just struck me. I think it was around 1959. There was a golden, it was a golden disc, just, it was beautiful, just hanging there. And it said, uh, wake up your mind. You're in a deep sleep, you know, and that stayed with me. Right? Another time, we were out in the desert experimenting with a light beam transceiver to communicate with them, and there was about 14 people. The guy you saw downstairs, Bob Short, was out there, and uh, he'd remember the incident because uh, we were using the light beam transmitter to lot for a line of sight transmission into the sky, saying. If you receive our signal, could you please respond? Of course, we were hoping for a signal back. They never responded through the light beam transceiver, although some people have been successful with it. Instead, for some reason, and there were others who were contactees out there that day, I was the one that heard, you know, just like they did over my driveway, they repeated this message. And they said, look for our bright blue flare in the west, three times. And I said, I better tell my buddy John here, because if it happens, he's not going to believe me if I tell him after the fact. So I told him. 
after I told him exactly what the words were, Bob Short, who's down here, said, somebody had asked him, well, what direction is west? And it was just like synchronized to some kind of a, you know, like it's like theater with these people, right? <laughs> he points like this, and just as he did, a blue bolide came right down. It, it looked like barbells, right? Very unusual, beautiful, right? And, uh, and John wrote about it eventually in his book, but he decided to leave my name out of it. That's John. Okay. This was John McCoy from uh -huh. Texas. So are, where are you from? Did this happen mainly in this Texas? This happened in the high desert of California. Oh. I'm not from Texas, <laughs> although I spent time in the Air Force there. Uh, my, uh, my contactee uh, type of experiences, I mean, a saucer never landed, invited me aboard. I do believe that I had encounters with people here on Earth that were not from Earth, very brief encounters back then and even later on. Okay, and it always seemed to happen at about the time that I launched an investigation into something. I wanted to know the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to college, left that contactee era behind me, uh, dropped out of college due to economic necessities, joined the Air Force, went into Air Force Security Service, uh, had one sighting while I was in the Air Force, uh, got discharged, uh, went into aerospace industry, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. That didn't happen because the aerospace in industry collapsed. Um, I got into computers, I started, I went to night school, learned programming, became a programmer, been one ever since. Um, you work at UCLA, is that right? I work at UCLA as a programmer analyst, senior programmer analyst. Uh, just about to retire. Um, I always loved science and engineering, though, so kind of regretted not going along that line. So you say you've had interactions with beings that I'm assuming they look human. These people could move among us. They could be downstairs and mingle and you wouldn't know it. Mm -hmm. Now it isn't because they don't have a few distinguishing features. They kind of like hide these features. Uh, they're in appearance, they're perfect. They were, would be our conception of perfect men and women. I mean, they have absolute symmetry of features, they have flawless skin, they have perfect eyesight, perfect teeth, perfect form, everything seems perfect as if they have mastered the genetic master plan. One difference is uh, you might notice if you looked at them is their eyes. Some of them have a little different eye coloring than you would see in a human, or they'll have these little sparkly uh, silver or golden flakes in their iris. Um, these types also were extremely strong. A five foot three woman can lift a six foot four man right off the ground the strength of ten men. Um, they could bend their fingers back. Um, they say we are related to them. We're, we, we are the hybrids, not them. They're the pure form of man, right? Or human, right? Um, that was the story we got back in those days. I lost contact in 1960. I actually saw two of them driving a car on a highway. They wanted to make contact with me. They let me know. And it was because there was another person that I knew in Hollywood who had contact with him who told me about that incident that happened on the highway that I'm fairly convinced because she wasn't there. And so how did she know, right? Um, I got interested in... Uh, some of the, uh, I started hearing about abductions, right? You know, Betty Hill abduction and everything. And at first, I rejected them. 
that wasn't, did not conform to the pattern I already knew. And believe me, back in the 50s, there were a lot of people that had contact experiences that never got up on an lecture stand, never wrote a book, were never interviewed on it, but I spoke to them. Mm -hmm. And in one particular case, some of these people showed up out at Giant Rock, four of them, with 36 witnesses out there. By the time I started going out there, I could only find two or three witnesses out of those 36. But but uh, the person I really felt strong about was George Van Tassel. I became a good friend of George Van Tassel's. Uh, I had so many conversations with that man. I always, you know, I just admired him. He had this tremendous breadth of knowledge, and he didn't have any real higher formal education. Uh, the other person I knew very well was Daniel Fry, because I was vice president of his, his group, and he was a brilliant guy, and he didn't have any formal education. So you're, you've been sort of one of the main researchers involved with Dan Burrish, right? Yes. Well, that's coming way up in time because it was when I started to investigate Brian Scott in the 1970s, who was an abductee slash contactee. He was both, right? Um, I spent four years on that case. That's how... Fascinating. And then it was during that period of time I spent four years that I had two of these guys walk into my house. Two of what guys? Whoever they were. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, uh, they came into my house. Well, I ran a rooming house with my wife in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, she's now deceased. But they came through that door. My friend John was in the kitchen. He never heard the door open. They just walked down the hallway, and they were dressed in suits, and they said, uh, we're from the health department, we received a complaint, we need to inspect the house. This guy, one goes upstairs, it was a three-room rooming house, I mean three-story rooming house. Uh, the other one went into what I call my library room. I had all these books, and I had a section all on UFOs. He goes into this room, and I thought, well, he's going to look at the floor, right, for cockroaches or, or, or mice or something, right? What's he doing? No, he's looking at my UFO books. So I stood in the doorway so that he couldn't get out of the room unless he came by me. So he came right up to me. I looked right into his eyes, and my brain jammed because I thought I was looking right into infinity, into a highly evolved being. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you the feeling that I had at that moment. And I'm thinking, who are you? Why don't you say something to me, right? That's what I'm thinking. When his partner comes down the stairs and says, we have to go now. So they exit the back door and I follow them out. And this guy that was in my library, he turns around at the end of the steps and says, do you have a cigarette? And I said, yeah. And at that time I smoked, so I gave him a Benson and Hedges. And uh, then he goes, he looks at me. He goes, do you have a light for this cigarette? And I had one of the new Bic lighters, and I handed it to him. And he took it, but he had it upside down. And he's looking at this thing, and he reaches for me like this and said, Would you please operate this mechanism for me? Now, who's, who talks like that, right? And I said, Oh, okay. And like he was a child, I showed him how it worked and lit his cigarette. And it was like he wanted to know what it was like, right? He took a draw, threw it away. We have to go now. So I yelled to my friend John. I said, John, get out of here on the double. Right. So he comes out. These guys headed for an alleyway, right? And I am only one house over from an inter intersection of two streets. I said, John, you take that street, I'll take this street. I want to know what car they get into. And I mean, we 
ran to the streets just as they disappeared out of sight. When I got back, to, I said, well, John, I didn't see anything. Did you? He said, no. I said, you didn't see a car pull away? No. Well, did you see the men walking? No. They vanished. Right away, I went to my wife and I said, call the health department now. I want to know who they sent down and why. She called. They never sent anybody down. <laughs> And what happens a few days later, one of the two more guys show up at Denny's restaurant. And I won't go through that whole scenario except one guy said, as we were listening to what they were talking about, because he was mentioning Brian Scott, and I'm going, how would two strangers know about Brian? He said to his partner, the humans are upset. And when I looked into his blue eyes, the same feeling. Right? And I'm going, who are these people? And they can walk right among us. See, well, my story is really not significant. There's no way I could prove these people were something extremely unusual. Other people have reported these type of encounters. Even Timothy Good has reported that type of encounter. There's Did you difference. write a book about Brian Scott? Uh, yeah. Well, I wrote when I finally got published, there's only one chapter in Alien Magic. Uh, I think it's chapter two. It's all about Brian. Okay. Because I was, you know, you said you, you went to Brian when we talked about Dan Burrish, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, yeah, because Brian was the first time I had heard about the years 2011 and 2012. When I met Dan Burish later on, I'm hearing about 2012. Okay. I'm just trying to rapidly scan through this. I went from uh, being interested in that. During that period of time, I was interested in the Brian Sky case. I had people coming to me that were former military people. This is how I got involved in that part. Now it turned into the 80s, and I had investigated oh, about a dozen abduction cases by then as a MUFON investigator, and or sightings, right, whatever they was in my area. Um, and then I, you know, and I even gave field investigator training classes after a while, and you know, I started really getting into it because I was, I was good at science. <laughs> Scientific investigation, at least. I had no training as far as, uh, you know, detective, police type, invest or forensics, right? But that fits in there, too. Mm -hmm. But, see, I transited over into suddenly people telling me about crash retrievals. And I got interested in that. Crash retrievals, during the mid-'80s, moved into underground bases, Area 51. I first heard about Area 51 in 1984 and about Lieutenant Robert Bond and, uh, and how he died in this plane crash and Lieutenant Commander, I mean Lieutenant General Robert Bond, who was Vice Commander of the Air Force Systems Command. And I'm going, it's awfully unusual for him to be test flying uh, mm -hmm. some aircraft, right? Why would a Vice Commander go out there and risk his life? They use uh, lieutenants, captains, and majors for doing test flights. Um, I knew that I was in the Air Force, <laughs> by the way. I was in Air Force Security Service. I had a top secret crypto clearance. So I was also. Uh, so, well, actually, with let's, that, right? let's hear a little bit about that. Did you, at the time you were in the Air Force, you were not privy to, I'm assuming, the UFO? No. No need um, to know. You, okay. So it, but you had always had you had this history behind you. Um, do you think that what or was the Air Force aware of that history? Yes. No, I, I had they, to have a top secret clearance. The FBI took six months to give me that clearance. They talked to some of my friends who knew me out at Giant Rock spacecraft conventions, uh, and I thought that's it. <laughs> They'll never give me a clearance, right? <laughs> no, no. They all, you know, these friends gave me. Uh, some glowing reports, so uh, they took me, and wow. I got my clearance. So, okay, so so as far as Dan Burrish is concerned... Yeah, he came along much later. I mean, I went through about 
I had collected testimony by that time that Stephen Greer, you know, who mm -hmm. got involved in his project of witnesses, he got his first witnesses from me. At that time, I had no project in mind like he did, you know, going to Congress. All I was doing was trying to collect the testimony. I was trying to keep confidential some of these people's names because they requested it. And I knew that they would just shut me off if I started yapping all over the place. But I was trying to find out what was going on. I had teamed up with Bill Steinman at the time. Bill Steinman led me to John Lear. Uh, John Lear led me to investigate Dulce, New Mexico. I went over there and drove all around that place with uh, Gabe Valdez back in, in the 80s. Uh, you know, it, I got hooked up with my friend Tal, who was an insider, outsider, you know, one foot in, one foot out, and kept giving me uh, tips and information and what have you to track down. So I got very involved. I met a guy uh, in the 90s that was uh, in reverse engineering, had, uh, had uh, flown one of our uh, reverse engineered craft to the moon and back. I mean, it was getting deeper and deeper, right? Did you ever meet Bob Lazar? Yes. I knew about Bob Lazar before anybody else did, through John Lear. Oh, of course. Of course. Okay. See, John Lear called me up one day, hey, i got a story to tell you, Bill. Uh, we got to go for a ride. He was a little paranoid. Let's get in my truck. And he told me all about Bob Lazar, except his name at the time. Because, you know, I guess. But he told me things about Bob that Bob had told him that Bob never mentioned. And, what you know, it's John's belief that they tinkered with his memories, right? Because he had heard, heard all of this stuff about the moon from Bob Lazar and stuff like that. Bob goes, no way, no way, right? But one day... Well, okay, wait, that's a little unclear. You're saying they tinkered with Bob Lazar's memories? Yes, with his memory. Not John Lear's? No, not John Lear's. In other words, Bob had, according to John, Bob had related all of this information to John, which later Bob denied that he had. No, oh, never in told a, him. yes, in a certain sense, there was a right. disconnect. He there kind of like disconnect. forgot right. that he ever knew that. Right. Okay. So there, there's yes, some <clears throat> some question as as far as that goes. So. Okay, so on the trail to Dan Burrish. Then I met Bill Uhouse. Okay. That's an important step. Bill Uhouse was a mechanical engineer who was speaking out at Rachel, and people said, You ought to meet Uhouse, because by that time, I had been speaking about some of these disclosures people were telling me about. So I met Bill Uhouse, and I thought it was hilarious. Here he had been working on um, a flight simulator for a flying disc so our pilots could learn how to fly them. And one of the uh, chief consultants on this uh, top secret project was an alien that he called J-Rod. Right? And that's where I first heard about J-Rod. In 1999, I'm on the internet and I find there is a, a website I stumbled across when I, you know, I typed in a search or something. And here was a document, and I, I said, boy, this document's awfully technical. I've never seen a document that was technical like this. We call it the Q94 document, <clears throat> and I'm reading through it. And I stopped when I got to it, and I saw extraterrestrial biological entity AQ dash J dash rod J rod in a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. And it was signed Captain Danny B. Crane, PhD. <clears throat> so I got a hold of the person and I ordered a copy of this and flashed it around and move on and said, hey, is anybody interested in this? I couldn't arouse any interest, believe it or not, right? And I went, okay. Um, and I couldn't get any more information until 2002, when this person, Marcy, 
contacted me and she said, you know, Bill, um, I need help. I need help. Dan's in trouble. Da, 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 da. And at that point, I had not met Dan. I had not met Marcy. And she had called me at work at UCLA. And I said, we have to sit down and talk. And uh, I think it was on a Friday. It was before, you know, and I was going to leave, go up to Vegas on that Saturday. And she called me in the in the afternoon, just before I left, it said, Bill, how would you like to meet Dan? And I said, are you kidding? Can you arrange that? And she said, yes, I can. So when I went there, I not only met Marcy for the first time, I met Dan. And when he first saw me, and I was wearing an Air Force cap, he took all these papers in his briefcase, and he stuffed all the papers in the briefcase, and he ran out of that room. <laughs> Because he didn't know who I was, and I said, oh no, you know. And um, Marcy says, I'll handle it, went over to the elevator, called me back in about five minutes later, and said, introduce me to Dan. And he was like shaking. I mean, it was serious. And he says, you know, I have to, he said, I'm very sorry I reacted like that. I have to watch myself. I've only got, you know, two hours of liberty, right? He said, uh, and Marcy says, I've got a private room, you know, in the library where we were. And um, so we went in there. I had one hour with him. He was very nervous. He was, he had a cold or something that first time. But some of the answers he gave me that first time knocked my socks off. I said, this guy has been an alien. Because there were certain things that he knew. It was so typical that I picked up along the way from Brian, from everyone, right? <clears throat> and you certainly had a background at that point to be able to evaluate somebody like that. Um, oh yeah, after 25 who years. Who is Marcy? Who is Marcy, would you say? She's a, she's an agent? No, she was just, she was working uh, for uh, the state of Nevada, okay? Um, she had a job in human resources because she's got a master's degree in um, uh, what do they call it? Organizational psychology, okay, which they hire those type of people in human resources. She was working with computers. She's very good at that. She's worked in casinos. Um, she's done casino uh, surveillance, you know, with those cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, she even wrote a book about, you know. How did she get involved family. with Dan then? She met him. Uh, well, that's a good sto a question because. I, the uh, first story that came to me is uh, uh, Dan's uh, mother was working at that same casino. Dan was working at that casino in security. And uh, she had observed him on camera a couple times doing some unusual things like going into this office, punching in a coat, hanging up the telephone, telephone ringing, and she could hear him saying, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, things like this. So. Uh, Dan approached her because she had some writing experience and said, I want to get out a story It's about research I've done on the planet Mars as a biologist. And she said, uh, really? So she got involved and um, as things progressed, she found out, you know, or she, was war she got warnings. Watch out, this man is involved with Area 51. Area 51. Not that story, you know, she says, that that's just a popular legend here in Las Vegas. And, oh no, this is for real. And so people were starting to give her documents. In fact, I got a copy of one of them, which I published in my book, which is a security oath that he signed up at the Tonopah Test Range back in the 80s. So, uh, now, ostensibly, they wrote the book. There were a couple of other men involved in this, and Dan and her. It was called Eagles Disobey. You can't get that book now, isn't that right? Um, there are copies of it, but there, there, it, she had assigned the rights to somebody, and that somebody did not assign the rights back to her when she requested it. The thing is, the only thing is, one day I get an email from Marcy, now, now, 2002, 3, 4, 
Young uh, passes on. Uh, at one point there, she thinks Dan has been captured or died or hurt or something. She doesn't know. She's scared. Uh, some of her contacts that she had told her you'd be safer to get out of town. So she came from Canada. So she went back to Canada. She contacted me when she was in Canada. And she started saying, I'm being followed. People are following me everywhere. And uh, uh, I'm worried. And uh, something's going on. And then I get, well, see, I got mysterious letters also in the mail <laughs> um, when it all started. From, I, I mean, are they, well, let's say that they're from the community, so to speak? From the black community, or right. black ops community. Threatening letters? No, not so much threatening as um, just saying, just giving me some information or just saying, Here's the status of things. Uh, it's kind of uh, dangerous, right? We we are friends of Dan's, but uh, you know, uh, certain things are going on. Well, this one, this guy sent me not only a letter; he sent me a, a photocopy, color photocopy, of Marcy from various angles in her apartment, her bathroom, her. In other words, there were planted cameras all over the place. And then finally sent me a picture of her with a majestic badge. M-A-J, right? Uh, usually has a letter and four numbers, just like Bob Lazar's. Um, only instead of H, like uh, Dan had, had an E, right? Symbolizing? Her website was taken down, her... Email was deleted. I had no contact with her. It was just like I got that letter, and then that was it. Have and you heard from? You've heard from her since then. Well, then I got word that she was back in Vegas. Not only okay, back so when, in Vegas, okay. but working with Dan as his operations director. Okay, so the, what does the E symbolize on that badge? Do you know? I, I haven't found out today. I don't know what the H or the E means, and I've asked. Maybe they'll tell me one of these days. I don't know. But it designates a classification of job assignment, I guess. Okay, so... I'm assuming the H has... What year was this that she sort of disappeared? Uh, late 2003, uh, reappeared in 2004, now as a member of Majestic. She, I mean, you're sitting there saying she's a member of Majestic. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But... Weren't you? I found I, I, out. I heard this another is... story. Oh. Okay, that's the the top story. Right sure. now, there's a story under that, and the story under that is she met Dan in 1980 in the UK. Not only that, there were see. There's all kind. This is what's so mysterious. Somebody starts sending us background material, uh, everything I could check out. Absolutely checked out. I have had conversations recorded, email intercepted. Uh, I was walking with my friend Winston outdoors. We were talking. That conversation was picked up by a spy device outdoors. Right. And regurgitated back to me in email. Oh. There were some errors, which was interesting. I have met Dan and had photographs taken from unknown people standing somewhere behind me in a casino sent to me by email to the point where I started saying, boy, this is either an elaborate hoax involving many people or it's the real thing, right? This is a covert operation of some kind because they have sophisticated enough technology that they can tap into our conversations, indoors or outdoors. They can intercept my email. They intercepted an email from my friend Alan to me that was just from him to me. Had some confidential information that they, and they wished to let us know that they knew. Sure. See, so it was this kind of thing that became more and more convincing all along. Okay, now I've heard that 
that you were invited to join Majestic. Is that a rumor or is that true? Uh, let me say this. I uh, knocked on the door. I started thinking, Dan, you know, um, you know, they sent you to school. I never completed my education in physics or engineering. And, and, uh, maybe they'll send me, you know, you know, and I'd say, yeah, could you get me in, you know? Uh, could, you know, do you think they'll take me up to uh, S4 or, you know, anything? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, Lazar talked his way into it. Maybe I can talk my way into it. I said, I have the opportunity here. And uh, so at some point, I think it was in, um, 2004, yes, 2000, in March 2004, Dan requested that I research something in physics, or actually pertain to biophysics and something he was looking into. And he says, you know, send me a, re uh, a paper on it. So I did, two, on biophotonics. He said, this is great, and uh, uh, that summer, he folded my papers up with all of his and went off to Washington, D.C. and delivered it. And I went, did I just contribute something to your project? And he said, yes, it's a matter of record now, right? And he says, don't worry, it's good stuff, right? And I'm going, oh, great. And I said, wait a minute. If I'm going to do that, I want I want the door to open. Well, then I get contacted by his security. Okay, you were in the Air Force. You took an oath. And da, 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 da. Right. For now, we want you to reply to this email that you will abide by the oath you took. Then, of you know, top secret oath. Right. And okay. Going, How can you do that? Right. Then I'm sent a message from Majestic One to William Hamilton saying, you have asked certain questions about Dan and we uh, have agreed, because they always have to agree, to provide you an answer and he starts going through a timeline. Right, starting in with Eisenhower's meeting with the Aikens, right? 1958 first treaty signed near Los Alamos. On, and coincidentally, my friend Robert sent me a photograph of a Majestic team in 1958 right outside of Los Alamos. And I'm going, whoa, what's going on here? This is getting stronger and stronger, right? I have published that full Yes, and why, why do you think they are doing this? I am being told that Dan was, you know, first they selected Bob Lazar and they said, we wanted to see what he would do, but he became um, a maverick, right? A little uncontrolled. Um, they had better control of Dan. They felt Dan uh, was very bright because he almost has, uh, well, he had an eidetic memory, okay? Um, and they just decided for reasons that weren't immediately apparent to me at that time, a little bit more apparent to me now, because it turns out that Dan was abducted when he was a child, um, that he should tell the world, but he should tell the world in a positive way, right? What is going on? And Majestic has, according to what I have found out, Again, I'm only reporting this. I have no way of verifying some of these things. But now I do know who all the current members are, right? They have met for the last time last year in assembly and have agreed not to meet, convene again for two years. And, they gave, and when they convened, they, they voted on giving Dan an order to tell the world. And uh, he has until the end of this year to accomplish that mission because they expect 
more and more radical changes which will become apparent to the public as we proceed into 2007, 2008, and on toward this omega point of 2012, which so, they expect us to survive. So, so basically, in a certain sense, you know, if I'm following you, you were denied access to joining MJ-12. Yeah, it was like I came along a little too late to really contribute anything. I mean, they agreed that I could start working with Dan if I wanted to, scientific projects. He still wants me to work on some of the science with him. It's just that I have uh, been recruited to work on another project of which I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement by another person who has kind of um, taken and proven that we have been reverse engineering craft and wants me to be involved in that. So, because I want to know what's going on everywhere, what do I do? I volunteer for these things. So, I have had a foot, um, it feels like I've had a foot almost in the door, but not to the point of where I wanted to be. Where I said, hey, show me the money, show me, not the money, show me the proof that you've got. So, so okay, but Dan. I'm in a very. Dan is alive. Position. Is still is alive and doing well at the moment. Is yes, that correct? Is. Yes, I only and, saw him a few weeks ago. Okay, and you visit him. You still visit him? Is it in Vegas? I'll see him tomorrow. In here. In Vegas. That's all I can tell you about. That. No, I understand. Um, you know, just Dan is sane. Okay, that, that's what I want to hear, is what your take is. Rational. Okay. Okay, and deals with facts as a scientist. Um, now, I saw a portion of the, this interview you did with him, but I, my understanding, the video in, interview was much longer. Are you releasing that? I'm not releasing anything uh, anymore because I don't have the rights. Meaning as far as, as Majestic 12 has the rights, no, Dan has the Ron rights. No, Ron Garner is here. If you want to interview him, he's here at this conference. Ron Garner. Yep. Is he was he, he involved in, in the with shooting money? of it? Yeah. Huh? Did he shoot it? I mean, I'm I'm just trying to figure out how he has no. rights. No. Well, he says that he has all the right connections to get Dan's story out to television. You know, all over, and apparently he has offered uh, Dan and Marcy enough evidence that he has these connections. Uh, I don't like it. I told Dan, I will not work with Ron Garner. Yeah. I published a book on Dan. I said, that's the end of the story. I told the story, I said, right in the introduction, I cannot prove this story to the public. But I know that I have seen enough and experienced enough because I have been as closer, I believe, than any investigator to Dan. And, um, there are things that, to me, uh, speak the truth. Okay, I mean, I'm aware, I mean, I've seen Dan use disinformation because he was ordered to. He doesn't like to, but he was ordered to for security reasons, and uh, I know how they use it. Now, the intel guys that specialize in disinformation sometimes they do it just for fun, get a kick out of spinning us around. And that's what I believe they've done with this Project Serpo, because it's just so full of errors. I'll put it that way mildly. Well, okay. Well, that's interesting. Do you happen to think, and you know, I'm gonna end this real pretty soon here, um, and you've been very gracious, and, and, and this is great. Um, but I was just wondering, in terms of Project Serpo, I know you've, you've pointed out some very, you know, accurate um, errors that have been, you know, recognized, uh, at least by Bill Ryan, and acknowledged. Um, but do you think there's any truth to the story? I think we have an exchange program. See, I've, I've been hearing this story on and off 
uh, for a number of years, and uh, I was supposed to meet a colonel from uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, I used to hold meetings out in Antelope Valley, and uh, one of my uh, people that came to the meeting met this colonel who looked at my book, even read through it, and said, hey, there's just about 80, 90 percent accurate. Then he started telling her, how would you like to see some real documents on this? And she goes, I don't think so, not if they're classified. And he said, I want to show you all the different levels of identification I've got. <laughs> and then he started telling a story. He says, I'm going to tell you this story because, you know, nobody's going to believe this anyway. And he said that uh, he has been on another planet where he could see two suns in the sky. And also he said, uh, I had a brigadier general, was a good friend of mine, he says, I was flying a jet out of Edwards and I crash landed. And there were a lot of injuries. I didn't think I would survive that. And they took me to the underground hospital at Edwards, underground facility hospital. And uh, they used some of the alien technology to put me back together. Hmm. So, you know, a story like this guy saying that he actually been to another world um, was fascinating. And I had heard stories like that. Nothing you could prove, right? Sure. But it seems like somebody gathered these together, um, changed the whole character of the Ebens, right? And put together this story somewhat like the Steven Spielberg Close Encounter, where they, they had 12 uh, people, I think two of them women, uh, 10 men, that were supposed to go aboard this craft. And I mean, they just weaved it all together, but they didn't pay very much attention to science. So what they describe is a planet around Zeta Reticuli with two stars that are only about as distant from the planet as our own sun is. Okay, that's impossible. The planet cannot, you know, which sun does the planet orbit? And there is no such uh, close 180 uh, million mile distance between two stars and Zeta Reticula. The two stars, Zeta Ret 1 and Zeta Ret 2, are over a light year apart. Say about 9,000 astronomical units compared to one astronomical unit. Okay, so that's one big error. And then they make the planet almost the exact same diameter as the Earth and give it a different gravitational constant, right? Then they say, uh, they didn't have any means of uh, tracking the time on the, pl on the planet Serpo. Um, but they did have this tower, which was something like a sundial, right? Uh, and they knew what time it was. And I said, you can't have advanced technology. You know, I protested without extremely uh, precise clocks and timing mechanisms. You can't even have a computer without that, much less a spacecraft that travels light years. Oh, who's the idiot who asked this question, right? I am. <laughs> I mean, I know technology, right? So, um, so do you, are you basically interested in writing any more books? I have branched out a little further away from just because I got interested in certain subjects as a, as a consequence of some of this research that fascinate me about the universe, about reality. Well, this is reality really. <laughs> Plus I had spent 22 days in an altered state of consciousness back in 1977. 22 days? 22 days. Meaning, what? are you talking about the Monroe Institute? or? Yeah. Um, this happened to me spontaneously while I was trying to concentrate my mind on the resolution of a particular problem. My mind accelerated. I could do high-speed mathematics. I could read Greek. I could read Latin. I could read people's minds. I could move objects. You know, this kind of thing. I was in a... I had people all around me. All my friends I used to gather with at the coffee shop, plying me with questions about everything. And here I am with the answers coming out of me like I was a cosmic computer. Okay, so uh, it was a, a life-changing experience that happened twice in my life. And uh, 
Actually, there was a third incident uh, in the 1980s, but now I'm very, very interested, like I wrote this book on time travel. I'm interested in anomalies in time, uh, multi-dimensional universe and things like this. And, uh, of course, uh, Bill Ryan and I, uh, we share a philosophy uh, on this where we believe that uh, uh, this is, we are spiritual beings that are immersed and trapped in our own creation. <laughs> And th this creation has now become greater than us. Where in truth, we are greater than it. And that's what was revealed to me in 77. And unfortunately, something happened where I woke up completely on the job. I was programming, and everybody in the office stopped working. They were affected by it. So um, this is real. I mean, it happens. And uh, do you think it's possible that uh, you know? And we can go off camera if you want. And let me know. It, it's possible that you were, uh, you know, there was a walk-in during those times. I think no. I I felt well. <laughs> now we're getting into things that you really don't need to pass on to the public, except... Okay, well, I can, I can weird. turn this off. I'd just okay. be curious. Turn right. She turned as white as a sheep. And she said, Oh, my God, you're talking to it. And I said, yeah, that's what I've been telling you all along. And then it occurred to me that she was just humoring me until she saw it for herself. Wow. And these experiments continued so that, uh, well, I had a very large object in 1958. Hover, it was coming in faster than a jet stopped on a dime. I had a friend from across the street over. I had my first telescope. This thing was as big as a 747 and it just hung in the air. That's what stimulated me to think, how does it do that? I, I'm going to study the science of gravity. I'm going to find out how it defies gravity and inertia, right? Two basic uh, qualities of a physical object that's in motion, right? Because when this thing it flipped end over end, and it started up again. I mean, it was just like uh, it had no mass. It just went and started to climb. And at that moment, I mean, my, my friend was looking through the telescope. It took that long for him to respond, look up, and see it rise into the clouds. And then, I mean, I, I used to, then I started calling them down, like using them for a yes-no game, right? It didn't even occur to me that there were logistics to this. Or... And so uh, we got up, and we looked all around the apartment. He and I were, he was a French-Canadian named Ives. He and I were uh, together alone in uh, his parents' apartment. And uh, we couldn't locate the source of the sound, so we decided to go outdoors. When we went outdoors, it seemed like the sound was emanating from the sky above us. So we uh, discontinued our little experiment, went downstairs, and sat on the grass. And as soon as we did this, the first thing that we saw was a very, well, it looked to us like it was tiny. A tiny red glowing disc just glide right over our heads soundlessly, right? One came by, a second one came by. At that moment in time, unknown to me, Ives continued the experiment. He was sending out a mental request for the second object that passed over to turn around and come back. And what happened as soon as he did that, the object executed a turn, a very, very tight 180, and came right back over our heads. Wow. 
And so he told me what he was doing, and he said, if we see more, let's do it together. And um, we saw two more appear, and uh, they were all traveling from north to south. And so uh, we sent out a request for them to turn around and, and follow each other, right? And they did. I mean, it was almost instantly. Well, all together that night we saw 14 objects. Uh, after that, um, Ives' father uh, had to move and took Ives out of school and I didn't see him again. In fact, I haven't seen him until about ooh, three years ago. He found me on the internet and I found out he was right over in Bakersfield and he drove over to see me. When we talked, I also found out that was the only UFO experience he ever had, and he still remembered every detail. He was impressed by it. So that was unknown to me at, at the time, and I, I continued the experiments for three years, well, only from my house, right, mm -hmm. until I took my... Uh, I was living with my aunt, my grandmother, and I took her outside, and I said, I've got one up there now. And she said, I'm watching television. And I said, well, you told me to tell you when I saw one of these, you'd like to see it. So I took her out there, and I said, there it is. And she says, that's it? And I said, yeah, right now it just looks like a light high in the sky. I said, but watch this. Turn left. So how did, did you interact with um It was aliens? 1957. Oh, wow. And... Um, what I knew about UFOs, I learned from what I call the California contactees back at that time. And uh, there wasn't a lot of controversy about the contactees, about UFOs, or whatever. Uh, one, in fact, I had started to meet the contactees. And uh, I was only uh, 14. And... Uh, had a, a buddy in high school, we were freshmen in high school, and I said, I would like to try an experiment. I would like to try an experiment along the same lines that George Hunt Williamson did in attempting contact with these UFOs. But, you know, I believe they're there, but I want to see if I can contact them. We tried this experiment, and obviously we did not have uh, ham radio equipment. We didn't have anything that we could use except an attempt at psychic contact by using pencil and paper. And uh, when we initiated this little experiment, we started to hear a sound uh, that was re reverberating throughout the room. He said to his partner, the humans are upset. And when I looked into his blue eyes, the same feeling, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going, who are these people? And they can walk right among us. See, well, my story is really not significant. There's no way I could prove these people were something extremely unusual. Other people have reported these type of encounters. Even Timothy Good has reported that type of encounter. Many UFOs. Many UFOs. And um, could you tell tell us who you are? Well, my name is uh, Bill Hamilton. I've uh, been involved in UFO research probably most of my life. I got involved in actual investigation of cases starting in 1976 with the Brian Scott case. And uh, that's when I joined MUFON and became a field investigator. So how long were you a field, field investigator for MUFON? Uh, probably since uh, 19, well, let's see, 25 years or, or more. 